manera de resumen curricular, les comento que Raúl se incorporó a la Facultad de Química de Rice en el verano del 2022 y es catedrático del Norman Hackerman Welch. Antes de incorporarse a Rice, Raúl fue profesor en el Departamento de Química de la Universidad de Pittsburgh. Él es originario de aquí, de la ciudad de Chihuahua. Durante sus años universitarios, Raúl trabajó de forma intermitente como asistente de investigación con el profesor Socina Heilen Caltech en los veranos del 2007 y del 2008. Posteriormente exploró la formación de membranas iónicas bajo la dirección del profesor Beit Klosgen en la Universidad del Sur de Dinamarca. Recibió una licenciatura en química en el Departamento de Química del Tecnológico de Monterrey en 2010 sobre la síntesis de dendrímeros cargados de fármacos. Luego se mudó a Cambridge, Massachusetts, para realizar un doctorado en química en Harvard bajo la tutoría del profesor Ted Bailey. Después de completar su tesis sobre química de coordinación y estructura electrónica de grupos de hierro, se mudó a la Universidad de Colombia para trabajar bajo la supervisión de Colin Nuchols. En la Universidad de Rice, sus intereses de investigación de grupos se encuentran con la interfaz entre la química orgánica e inorgánica sintética para crear nuevos materiales funcionales y catalizadores capaces de activar moléculas pequeñas en sitios de reacción polinucleares, creación de nuevos compuestos aromáticos retorcidos y el diseño de receptores aniónicos para la eliminación de sustancias químicas más preámbulo, muchísimas gracias por aceptar esta invitación y todo suyo el estrado. Bueno, muy buenas tardes a todos, eh, muchas gracias a, a la Sociedad Mexicana de Física por la invitación, en particular a la maestra, la doctora Martel. Eh, efectivamente, yo les vengo a platicar un poco de lo que, de lo que mi grupo de investigación hace, y sobre todo, eh, quiero que, que, que vean un poquito de cómo mezclamos eh, la ciencia. Realmente, eh, para mí, pensar en, en, en una ciencia en específico ya no me funciona, porque abarcamos demasiados campos y lo más importante es crear una multidisciplinaridad entre los investigadores. ¿no? Entonces, eso yo creo que es algo fundamental. Les pido una disculpa de antemano porque <coughs> ando un poco enfermo, eh, los viajes ya no me, ya no me ayudan mucho, eh, entonces eh, voy a estar tomando un poquito de agua. Y también la otra disculpa es porque mi plática va a ser en inglés, eh, cualquier pregunta en español es bien recibida, eh, la verdad es que pues, ya la tengo platic, eh, practicada en inglés, eh, 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 entonces para mí es muy difícil, tardaría unas tres o cuatro horas darla en español, pero bueno. Antes que nada, yo siempre eh, le agradezco a mis estudiantes, ese es mi grupo de investigación. Eh, realmente, yo ya no realizo eh, la investigación en, 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 en el laboratorio, yo me encargo de estar dirigiendo a mis estudiantes, de estar escribiendo eh, propuestas de investigación, de estar revisando, de estar escribiendo artículos, de realmente estar generando ideas. ¿no? Pero realmente todos los que están en esta, en esta foto son, son mis estudiantes eh, de… De, desde profesional, doctorado y, y postdoctorado, tengo de los tres. Y aquí está, está acá abajo está una foto del campus uh, de Rice, donde nos mudamos en el, en el verano del 22. Eh, aquí pueden ver en estos edificios eh, con teja roja, todo esto es la universidad y estamos colindando con lo que es el TMC, que, sig que significa Texas Medical Center. Entonces, cuando ustedes escuchan de alguien que va a algún procedimiento quirúrgico o algún procedimiento médico en Houston, está sucediendo justamente aquí. Este es uno de los centros médicos más grandes del planeta. Bueno, let me tell you about the problem that we're trying to address here. And the problem we're trying to address, I like to walk. The problem we're trying to address has to do with population growth, right? So in that slide, you have essentially how the world's population has grown from almost nothing to a staggering 8 billion people, right? 8 billion with a B, right? And this is just a 4,000 uh, years span. So it goes from um, 2000 BCE, this is before the Common Era, 
uh, all the way to 2023, right? And so one of the things that, that I'd, I'd like to highlight, right, is this, this massive exponential growth, right? There has to be a reason why the population just, grow, just grew exponentially right around that time in, 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 uh, in our era, right? And that time is around the 19th century, at the beginning of the 19th century. That is because there was the need of producing more nitrogen-containing compounds. Why do we care about nitrogen-containing compounds? Because they are found in fertilizers, which we need to grow uh, more plants, right, to grow to, for agriculture. Uh, they're found in, uh, in pharmaceuticals. Uh, they're found in explosives. Uh, actually, that was, that was one of the reasons why it detonated, because we had, you know, the First World War. And back then, at the beginning of the 19th century, uh, most of the, of the nitrogen uh, that, that was mined was either coming from uh, nitre, which is essentially potassium nitrate, just a mineral, or seabird excrement. It's, it's highly, uh, it, it contains a lot of nitrogen uh, containing compounds. So, um, you know, there were, there were companies dedicated to essentially uh, recover that excrement. Uh, but really the, the, uh, the, you know, the, the breakthrough development happened right around 1910 when it was demonstrated for the first time, industrially speaking, the Haber process. Now known as the Haber-Bosch process, but back then it was just Haber demonstrating that nitrogen plus hydrogen in a, a catalyst bed can generate two molecules of ammonia. From ammonia, you take it and you generate a lot of different uh, compounds. Um, some of those are, for example, in, as I was just saying, fertilizers, uh, refrigeration, explosives, textiles, and pharmaceuticals. More recently, um, this is according to the Royal Society, um, we're trying to get, um, you know, uh, or use ammonia as, a, as, a, as a either a fuel or a if you want to think about it as a molecule containing hydrogen so that we can transport hydrogen, right? Um, that's a very nice paper, by the way. I, I encourage you to read it. It's actually, I think it's freely available. Um, anyhow, in the planet, about 50% of what we, um, what we use uh, comes from nitrogen that has been fixed by industrial processes. And that's essentially the middle part here of, of this, of this uh, chart, right? This uh, middle part accounts for about 210 million tons of ammonia per year, right? Now, just to give you an idea of the size of this uh, uh, process, it uses about, you know, nearly 2% of all global energy. 2%, that's a lot of energy, right? And that 2% is dedicated exclusively to produce ammonia. Now, because we need hydrogen for that ammonia molecule, uh, we need to generate hydrogen. Um, and the, 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 the way to generate hydrogen uh, comes from steam methane reforming, which also generates a, an interesting 1.8% um, uh, uh, of the total CO2 global emissions, right? That's, that's also a pretty sizable uh, amount, right? So that tells you two things. We're not going to go away from uh, ammonia production. We need ammonia production, that's for sure. I mean, we need, again, fertilizers, we need refrigerants, we need, like it or not, explosives. Uh, you know, you wouldn't want that, but it's happening. Um, so we need to find ways of generating ammonia in a more, one, sustainable way, green way, and, 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 and in a way that, you know, we can, we can be uh, more kind to the environment. Okay, so how does it happen in, in the uh, enzymatic uh, fixation? You have an enzyme called nitrogenase, and nitrogenase is the one in charge of the nitrogen reduction, so it takes eight electrons, eight protons, and generates ammonia. Um, it happens in that cofactor that I'm showing you there. It has um, seven or eight iron atoms, and uh, it has distances that are in the order of 2.6 uh, metal to metal, right? 
Now, just to put to calibrate yourself, right? 2.6 angstroms. That's fairly short, right? If you start thinking about distances in iron metal, uh, you know, ranging around 2.86 uh, for the 100 plane. Now, during the fixation of the nitrogen, you have essentially eight intermediates. You have it here going all the way from, um, where's my cursor? Uh, from E0 to E8, and essentially all of these steps, these are telling you how many electrons and protons have been added to the cofactor, right? One of the critical ones is E4, because that, uh, that's the step that is proposed to engage thy nitrogen. And um, we know that it engaged thy nitrogen, forming a species that we don't know the topology of this compound. We just know that it has two nitrogens and two hydrogen atoms, right? And that's embedded in this iron four phase. Now, The question here is, what happens after this particular step, right? What happens in E5, E6, E7, E8? What's the topology like? If we were to know how exactly that nitrogen atom is bound to those iron centers, then we could potentially or hypothetically produce better catalysts, right, that can uh, allow us to get uh, ammonia. So if we want to do it synthetically, right, in the laboratory, and explore this process, then how would we go about producing, uh, you know, scaffolds relevant to enzymatic activation? And so that's where uh, that's where I started my PhD. I, I usually don't add anything from my PhD because it's long time, and, and we have a lot of things going in my group. But I thought it was going to be relevant for this particular talk, just because all of the magnetism that we did back then to understand the electronic structure of these compounds. And so back then we were thinking, so how do we create clusters by design? That's a ligand system, right? Um, and you have, uh, you know, it, it's, 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 it's drawn in a C3 symmetric fashion, although, you know, you can, if, you, you, if you think about the ligand, right, it's quite flexible. Point is, you can form a trinuclear and hexanuclear species uh, of that form. You have a dimeric structure where two ligands come together to form an iron-6 system. We can get crystal structures of those compounds. Shown there is the, um, the all ferros, so iron-2 uh, species. And uh, notice uh, the iron-iron distance is in the order of 2.6, right? Keep in mind that 2.6 is the distance found in the enzyme. Um, Analyzing this type of compounds, we notice that it has a pretty sizable um, spin ground state, right? That's an S equals six, or the, the data is fit to an S equals six. Um, S equals six, that means 12 ampere electrons. If we go down in temperature and probe these at low temperature, high field, we can determine the um, the, the, uh, the zero field uh, splitting parameters, and there you have uh, that it fits really nicely to an S equal six. So again, we have 12 ampere electrons in this compound. Now think about how many molecules you know containing 12 ampere electrons that behave as a single molecular uh, entity. There, there aren't that many. If we look at the structure of this compound, you have here um, essentially each iron atom is residing in a in a four coordinate environment, square planar. And so if we start mixing orbitals according to symmetry, then we get to a, a, a depiction uh, like that one I'm showing there on the, on the left, where we populate it uh, in order to fit the experimental uh, observation, right? Which is 12 ampere electrons. Now, we're thinking of this as a, you know, imagine a, a meta atom, right? This is no longer a single iron center, but this is, all six iron atoms are behaving as a single entity. So um, we were exploring a little bit about this compound. We reduced it, uh, you know, uh, provided ligands to coordinate to this compound. Uh, we can obtain it in, in, a, in a few different oxidation states. Here you have now the monoreduce on the left. These are uh, monoreduce. These are uh, the dianionic. So we have added two electrons. Uh, and then on the, on the, on the right-hand side, we have the cationic species, where essentially now we have 
uh, removed an electron from the entire um, iron cluster. And we can get the, the, the crystallographic characterization of all of those compounds as sh sh shown there. And one of the things that now we can start doing, or we, we, were, you know, we were doing back then, was, well, if we have already analyzed the magnetic properties of this compound, you know, what, what will happen once we start eating, either adding electrons or removing electrons? Especially because the topology of the cluster is not changing. It's exactly the same in that you know, we have the crystal structures to prove that, right? Why is that relevant? Well, because we can hypothesize that the combination of atomic orbitals from those iron atoms is not changing, right? So presumably we can take the already derived molecular orbital diagram and then just add or remove electrons and see if that fits the experimental observations. And so um, when we probe the dianionic species shown here and we collect the magnetic susceptibility, um, now you see this is the neutral compound that, that I showed you a few slides ago. And now we find an S equals 11 spin ground state. Right, S equals 11, now we have 22 ampere electrons. Back then in 2018, uh, that was the record uh, of any molecule uh, having a uh, spin ground state of 22 ampere electrons that persist and it's isolated up to room temperature. Uh, there's been a report of another molecule just recently. Um, so we explored the other, the other series, the other compounds, and notice that you know, they're, they're, uh, their spin ground states seem to be all over the place. We have, uh, by essentially uh, adding two electrons, we go to an S equals 11. Then we add uh, the, the singly reduced species. Uh, it fits to a 19 halves. And then uh, the uh, monocationics, they fit to a 9 halves and an 11 halves, respectively. Right? So, so how can we understand these this, this, this properties? Right? Why are they changing so much? So uh, just to verify, we collected the, uh, the low temperature, high field uh, data for both of these compounds uh, that had the largest spin ground state, the S equals 11 and S equals 19 halves. And both of them show uh, or correlate with the magnetic susceptibility data. So that's great, right? So we can be certain that we're looking at, at you know, we're, we're, we're uh, actually uh, finding the same result by e uh, either of these two measurements. So, this is a, the <coughs> this is the um, uh, the diagram that I just showed you for the neutral species, the S equals six, right? And this is the data that I just showed you in the previous slide, the, uh, just highlighting the S equals eleven and the and the nineteen halves, um, and this was essentially the possibilities when we add one electron. You have your neutral compound. You add a single electron, nothing is changing because we know that from the crystal structure. All of the distances are re essentially remaining the same. So the question is, do we add an electron that goes here in this orbital and pairs up, or do we have an electron going in one of these vacant orbitals producing a, a 13 halves? We know that none of these are observed, but presumably, if we're populating um, these orbitals higher up in energy, we're presumably disturbing them because they are anti-bonds. So they were, if, if we put an electron there, we're going to bring uh, the energy down of those orbitals. And so that's how we can explain the 19 halves that we have. Now, these 19 halves uh, can bind ligands. Uh, we know um, the disolvate, um, but it's only rearranging uh, some of these orbitals because we're finding the exact same 19 halves spin ground state. Now the tricky part is in order to get to an S equals um, 11, so 22 ampere electrons, the only way that that can happen is by bringing these um, um, orbitals up in energy down so that we can actually have an S equals um, 11 populated and, um, and, and, and that, that fits with our, with our molecular orbital description. Uh, 
Now, this is essentially where I finished my PhD back in 2015. Um, and this wasn't published until 2018 because we were figuring out all of the details uh, in fitting the data and whatnot. Um, in fact, one of the, one of the funny things uh, that, uh, that, that I usually tell my students is, don't worry about, you know, publishing, 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 because they're gonna come. I mean, I, I defended my PhD with no publications of my work. Everything was published after I defended, everything. I had publications from collaborations, but none of my work was published before I defended. It was, everything was published in a span of six months, and then this last publication uh, three years later, or three and a half. Anyhow, so, and so this is, you know, what I was doing when I was, again, a graduate student, right, a PhD student. So, you know, this, this idea of, of ammonia uh, uh, production kept in my head, you know, just banging there, just, you know, I was thinking, how can we actually make a catalyst? So now we're here with this work, we prove how we can produce clusters by design, right? So we proved that we can have very significant metal-metal interactions that can result in single spin manifolds. We proved that we can have high spin topologies as a result of these uh, strong metal-metal interactions. The one thing we couldn't do was interaction with substrates um, because it, it did not engage uh, with anything other than pyridine, those two examples I show you, that was it. So when I was you know, uh, writing proposals for my own group, um, I started thinking about how we can do this in a better way. So I thought about cartoons that look like this, right? That's essentially just a, how, how I think in, in my head, right? How to produce a cluster. You have a basket, and then in this basket, you essentially um, use it as a rigidifying object that allows you to have ligand arms into this basket, which then can nucleate uh, cluster systems. And so with the one, or the first one that we produced was this, um, tetraamine species that my student Manasseh um, worked with, and he was able to produce, in this case, copper, um, copper compounds. These copper compounds, uh, in the solid state, they dimerize, they form a, a, a metal four to metal four cofacial structure. And one of the interesting things is that in copper, this is 3.2 angstroms, um, metal four to metal four centroid, as you go down to silver, to gold, but especially to silver, you see a contraction, right? So that contraction is counterintuitive because if anything, you would expect an elongation. Why? Well, simply silver is a much bigger ion than copper, right? Yet, instead of seeing an elongation, you see a contraction. So what that tells us is we have some sort of interaction across the metal four planes playing uh, some you know, some attractive roles or they're engaging in some orbital overlap that, are, that, that is causing the systems to, to engage with each, with each other. So right now we have a collaborator doing computational uh, chemistry uh, or I guess computational uh, uh, experiments to test and, and dissect some of these uh, interactions. Right. Um, now if we start oxidizing these species, we can, uh, obtain an, an EPR active compound uh, that at 80 Kelvin seems like a spin localized, uh, copper two, a classic copper two. Now when you start raising the temperature up to room temperature, uh, it, it essentially that goes away because presumably it's delocalizing across the copper atoms. Now why is this relevant? Well it's relevant because one of the um, enzymes that engages with N2O um, and this is the, the cofactor, it does it with a similar electronic structure as reported by, by Ed Solomon at Stanford. Um, so we have a synthetic system that replicates that electronic structure. Right. Now, a, a few changes into the ligand architecture. And so, um, you know, comparing this compound with the previous one, uh, the only difference is that we have this uh, ether and, 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 and methylene um, um, functional groups in the, in the ligand making this compound a little bit taller. So presumably we can host a guest in this cavity. 
And that's, uh, that's the crystal structure right there. And that's actually true. So hosted there, you have an acetonitrile molecule. Now, acetonitrile is a solvent. You know, nothing, nothing out of the blue. Uh, it's pretty standard. Uh, but what that tells us is that if we were to follow how acetonitrile binds, we can, we can uh, follow these hydrogen atoms via NMR and, 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 and test for other substrates. And the one substrate that we were testing was dioxygen, right? Again, this is copper one. This is an all copper one system. If, 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 if you've ever worked with copper compounds, you know that copper one compounds almost immediately upon exposure to dioxygen, it goes to copper two, um, you know, in, 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 in the process producing superoxides, peroxides, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now in this case, that doesn't happen. In fact, what we have is an O2 molecule hosted within this compound. Now that's pretty, that's pretty substantial because we're hosting O2 only by non-covalent interactions. Think about O2 transport in your body, right? Hemoglobin, right? That's how we transport oxygen in our bodies. Now hemoglobin captures O2 eventually once the, the, the O2 molecule finds the cofactor, it forms a covalent bond forming a superoxide, an iron-3 superoxide system. And then when it, when it reaches the, the place for delivery, it unbounds O2 and, you know, used for whatever process in your body that is, 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 is going to happen, right? Now, the thing is that you're transporting O2 covalently, but somehow that molecule has to reach that pocket with millions and millions of non-covalent interactions. This is an example of a well-defined non-covalent interaction um, for O2. Uh, it's probably one of the few uh, molecular systems that can do that. Um, I'm going to skip the ramen. Um, now, let me turn the page to iron compounds. So this is where, where we, you know, we, were, we were tracking back the idea of the nitrogen fixation, right? Ammonia production. So I, I told you that <coughs> it's being hypothesized that the, um, the nitrogen activation takes place at this iron 4 site. Right. So presumably, you need an iron-4 system capable of engaging with um, substrates. And so we developed this ligand in my group, um, and, uh, and, and, and we were able to deprotonate, form the tetralithio species shown here, that you can metallate with uh, metal-2 species. The whole idea here is that you can obtain essentially all compounds going from manganese all the way to zinc, the, the, the nickel and, and copper are not shown here because we haven't been able to crystallize them, but we have good spectroscopic evidence that we can get them. Um, the point is that they all have the same topology, right? So as, except for chromium, which we have a very short distance, presumably a, a multiple bonded chromium-chromium dimer. Um, but if we take the iron system here and further expose it to metallation conditions, we isolate this type of iron-6 compounds. Now, this is a different type of cluster from the ones I was working uh, back when I was a, a PhD student. The main difference is that this one has now an open face, if you wish, to engage with any substrate that you provide to it. Right? It's, this is essentially now a basket, but a basket of iron atoms. And so, um, we were testing its potential oxidation levels, doing electrochemistry, and if you, uh, exp uh, uh, if you have uh, this iron-6 system in uh, acetyl nitrile, you can obtain or you can observe the plus one and the minus one um, oxidation levels. In fact, you can re repeat this a few times and, 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 and further expand the potential window to observe the plus two, the minus two, the plus three, the minus three, and even the minus four. Right, so that's, that's pretty substantial because now this molecule can actually access eight different oxidation levels. Think back on the, uh, the nitrogen fixation scheme that I showed you in the past for eight different levels for nitrogen fixation. That's eight different electrons added to the cofactor. Well, this molecule is capable of uh, existing 
in eight different oxidation levels. Again, there aren't that many molecules, molecules that can, uh, that, that have this, this particular behavior. Um, we would like to isolate all of them, <coughs> but so far we have been able only to, uh, uh, to isolate uh, the mono uh, reduce. But, but now you can see, you know, at least how I think, right? And, 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 and the idea is, well, we need to isolate all of those, characterize them with, you know, spectroscopic methods, uh, magnetometric methods, electrochemical methods, and really produce a picture, right, that tells us um, how we can best use some of these compounds. And, um, and actually on that, on that front, uh, these compounds can activate small molecules. So if you provide sulfur, S8, which is a cyclic molecule, it can activate it, essentially abstracting a single sulfur atom to produce this mu4 sulfide. Um, the same thing happens with an, an oxygen transfer reagent, and the same thing happens with a nitrogen transfer reagent. So there you have a mu4 nitride, oxo, and sulfide. Now, why is this relevant? Well, it's relevant because in, in the enzymatic catalysis, um, we don't know if a mu4 nitride is a potential topology that the, and the, that the enzyme goes through. Um, and we don't know because it's really hard to essentially observe intermediates during, the, uh, during enzymatic catalysis. But potentially, we, can, we could start comparing the spectroscopic signatures between this compound and the, uh, the enzyme and see if the, uh, a, a topology like this is, is relevant, right? Again, keep in mind that nitrogenase has been studied for more than 70 years, 80 years. So a lot of, a lot of these things are still unknown. So I think we have a, a unique approach here uh, to provide answers to those intermediates. Um, another important uh, uh, piece of information for these type of molecules is that they're not dead ends. They actually have, uh, um, we can for the reduce them, for the for the oxidize them to either the, the plus one state, the plus two, or the minus one, or the minus two for all three different cases, right? So presumably we can start changing the electronic structure uh, going from a nucleophile to an electrophile. Right? And that will change, in turn, the reactivity of these compounds. Anyhow, so um, I'm going to stop there with the first story I wanted to tell you. Um, and now I'm going to turn into a story about anion recognition. Um, and um, yeah, I hope, uh, I hope you have heard about this type of, of compounds. It's, it's, it's making a, a big buzz in the in the news. Um, so these are for fluorinated compounds. And I'm going to tell you a story that has to do with anion binding. Right? And the type of anions that we're concerned are these two type of anions. Um, essentially, you have in a PFAS, which stands for uh, pair and polyfluorinated alkyl substances, you have, generally speaking, a carboxylate end group or a sulfonate. And, oops, um, okay. Bueno, no es la batería, eh? Bueno, esto generalmente pasa, entonces. A ver, se me hace que ya, ya regresó. Bueno, si no me quedo aquí. Pero entonces tengo que cambiar de la. ¿O me ayudas? Ok, perfecto. Muchas gracias. No lo van a creer, pero he ido a tantas conferencias que esto siempre pasa, entonces es algo muy común. Bueno, um, yeah, I was talking about anion recognition, right? So, um, why do we care about these particular anions, PFAS? Right? So, we care about PFAS because in your body, 
they're fairly detrimental, right? Um, so it can cause, you know, anything from, from you know, just reduced response to vaccines uh, to essentially developing problems uh, in the, in the, in, during pregnancy, to liver damage, kidney cancer, you name it. There's a lot of different health-related issues with ingesting PFAS. Now, one of the problems associated to, to PFAS is the residency time in your body. It can stay there between four to eight years, you know, give or take, right? That's a long time. That's a really long time. Um, now, it, it has some statistics having uh, put out and, and, and say that about 99% of adults in the U.S. have some measurable levels of PFAS in their blood. Um, now, how or when did these chemicals start? They can be traced back to 1930 with the development of Teflon. It was really the, this application, the, the, uh, the AFFF, the aqueous film forming foams, that really got uh, the attention of scientists. Uh, the reason is because these foams, you may have seen it in, in, uh, in movies, but this actually happens. This is how firefighters train uh, when they have to put out really heavy fires. Um, so this was in the 60s. Soon after, in the 70s and, and forward, a lot of different applications were developed uh, where, where, where PFAS is part of the key ingredient. So essentially anything that, can, that is water repellent, uh, heat resistant, um, oil repellent, um, uh, it has some plasticity to it, um, has PFAS. This carpet, my jacket, my pants, shoes, uh, medical devices, this very uh, pointer, uh, everything has PFAS, literally everything. Um, I'm going to show you, um, well, yeah, th let me show you this, this pie chart. Uh, this is a pie chart put out by the, by the FDA. Um, and in this pie chart, you have just common items that you find in the supermarket. And I usually ask the audience, do you like ice chocolate cake? Because if you do, according to the FDA, on average, that has about 17 thousand parts per trillion. Okay, keep that in mind. 17,000, 17,000. Last year, um, I was going to go to a conference and I asked my student, uh, Nicole, she was a freshman, I said, hey Nicole, uh, help me out. Um, I don't have time to, to look up in the news articles uh, where people are talking about, about PFAS. Can you just give me you know, eight to ten different news articles from reputable sources uh, where they are discussing uh, PFAS. Um, and so here you have an example of those spanning from late January to mid-February or so. And these are <coughs> just a few examples, right, of, uh, of, of, of materials, of, of uh, you know, uh, you know, food containing uh, uh, PFAS. One of the ones that really, you know, strike my attention was this one. So this is a study by the University of Oxford where they detected 26 different PFAS 30 feet down into the Arctic ice. That's 10 meters roughly, right, into the Arctic. The question is, <laughs> how did those uh, got in there in the first place, right? I mean, um, anyhow. So, why um, are PFAS ending up in our body? Because we're drinking them. And this is a study um, in, a, in, in the US, but trust me, a similar map can be drawn where PFAS is found in many cities across the planet. Um, we just don't have the manpower to measure them. But in this case, of, in, you know, in, the, in the US, you have uh, all of the cities, towns, where you have a light blue dot, that means that the, the amount of PFAS is above the proposed limit, right? So that means that, you know, if you're used to, uh, say, going to El Paso, stay in a hotel, open the, 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 the sink, drinking water from there, you're drinking PFAS. 
The same thing is true for the water that you're, that you're given in a restaurant, that, you know, this water, if we were to measure it, I, trust me, we've done the, the experiment, it would have some background level of PFAS. Cheers. <laughs> but it's, it's inevitable. I mean, we just now know about the size of this problem. Because guess what? PFAS is transported through the rain, right? So not only the places that were initially contaminated because they were training with, say, AFFF are contaminated, but you have contamination across, you know, the globe. So um, this is another study, right, finding that about 200 million people in the U.S. are exposed to PFAS in their tap water. This is the level for PPT that the EPA has set to be the maximum contamination limit. Four parts per trillion, right? Now keep in mind the, the other number I gave you about ice chocolate cake, 17,000. So you already consume enough PFAS for your entire life. That's essentially what it means, right? So, so this is, right now this is a super hot topic in the US where millions and millions of dollars, billions actually with a B are, are poured into this, into this research area. This pie chart, or this chart, sorry, uh, was produced by some of the, uh, one of the leading groups in this research area at Northwestern University. And notice that most of the um, materials studied in here um, cannot really address the environmentally relevant concentrations, right? Um, these are three of the, just, just an example of three materials developed by three different groups in the US uh, that can take environmentally relevant concentrations of about one microgram per liter or one parts per billion down to uh, PPT levels. And so when we were thinking about this, this problem, uh, we were already designing uh, anion receptors. And so we were designing receptors that look like this, where you essentially have a recognition site right here in the middle. Um, and so we tested and we, we synthesized all of these variants. We determined that this one right here was the most active one for anion recognition. Uh, we tested different anions shown here in blue. The red trace is just to guide the eye. It has nothing to do with a, with a fitting or anything. But what we found is that methyl sulfonate was off the plot. So this was the eureka moment that told us, look, if methyl sulfonate binds so strongly that you cannot remove it, then perhaps you can start testing this against uh, PFAS. And so going forward, it binds uh, methyl sulfonate extremely strong. Uh, even if you were to boil it in DMSO at 100 degrees C, the, the host guest product, this, is not um, broken down. Um, so that means that the salvation energy of DMSO is not enough to essentially pull off the, the anion from, from this binding pocket. Um, that's the crystal structure, just to show you how it binds. But most importantly, this is where we were thinking of, okay, let's, let's design this into a potential anion receptor that we can remove PFAS from water. In order to do that, we needed to do a, a small synthetic modification, and we appended this terminal epoxide so that we can actually produce polymers. And so we produced this type of polymers that we're calling PFMs. And um, in the last two slides, I'm going to show you the data uh, for some of the most refined polymers that we have now. And that's when we were starting to test uh, at one parts per billion. Um, and here I'm showing you uh, on the y-axis the residual uh, PFOA concentration versus time. Notice that in this case, the blue, the blue dots show that we can kind of get to, the, to that uh, limit of 4 PPT after 48 hours, right? That's not ideal, right? That's, that's two days, right? We want to get there faster. So one slight modification that we did in the, in the um, synthesis of this compound allowed us to get there in two hours, right? Now we're talking about something that you can actually use um, for, for, for PFAS removal, right? We're talking about timeline or scales, time scales that are relevant to us. Um, in fact, when we moved to the to the, uh, the ultra low concentration of 0.1 ppb or 100 ppts, uh, which is extremely hard because most materials cannot even, you know, essentially see uh, that concentration. 
um, we were, uh, you know, we, we were satisfied to find that, that the kinetics uh, actually uh, work much faster than, than at 1 ppv, uh, and we can get uh, below the, the 4 ppt threshold in about 40 minutes, right? So that's fantastic. But this is really not addressing the environmental concern, right? Because the environmental concern is drinking water. This is milliQ water, right? This is ultra pure water. So um, when we moved to this building at Rice, which was last summer, I, I, was, I, I told my student, Lul, I said, Lul, you know, we're not gonna go and, and, and start producing uh, water matrices, right? We're not gonna model drinking water. Uh, like you find in the literature. We're going to use drinking water. And so in one of the new uh, water fountains from the building, we went there, we took that water that we drink every day, and we spike it with uh, PFOA. And these are the results. So you have the real water or drinking water shown here in blue, and this is the data I just showed you with, uh, with milliQ water, right? So this is my concluding slide, and this is just to show you that the challenge is significant, uh, it's pretty sizable, yet I don't think it, it's, it's, it's impossible. We can, we can get there. Um, and with that, I'd like to, th to thank uh, funding agencies, uh, my students, uh, La Sociedad uh, Mexicana de Física, La Doctora Martel por la, por la invitación, y a todos ustedes por su, por su atención. Y con gusto le respondo preguntas. ¿Alguna pregunta? Tenemos tiempo para una pregunta, dos preguntas. Adelante. Este valor, el valor inicial de una parte por billón, ¿no? que está sin, en, lo, en, en la última parte, Ajá. ¿por qué eliges ese valor en particular? ¿O ese es característico del agua cuando tú la analizas? Porque vi que para el milky water y para el otro caso, para el agua el top water, ¿no? Las dos es este, el mismo valor. ¿Pero por qué inicias o por qué tomas ese valor inicial? Sí, claro. Mira, la razón es porque en, en la literatura está reportado que justamente en, a un PPB o un microgramo por litro es donde la mayoría de los materiales dejan de funcionar. Entonces, nosotros no queríamos replicar algo que ya estaba hecho, sino más bien mejorarlo, ¿no? Y realmente quisimos empezar en el punto de partida donde, donde muchos de estos materiales eh, pues ya no funcionan. Entonces, ese era la, el reto, pues. Por eso, por eso empezamos de un PPB. Y aparte de por, que... Y es... si tú tomaras un valor más elevado todavía, ¿ves la misma tendencia o, o qué pasa ahí? O... Sí, la cinética de absorción es más lenta, porque pues, tienes una concentración más alta. Eh, lo que sucede es que, por ejemplo, aquí si te fijas, es above realistic conditions, o sea, realmente estas condiciones son, son, son irreales, ¿verdad? No existen, son solo en, la, en escala de laboratorio. Esta, esta mitad del, del, de, la, de la gráfica es donde te encuentras bases militares que están altamente contaminadas, o, o sitios que por alguna razón están altamente contaminados, pero la gran mayoría de, los, de las ciudades, de los pueblos que, que, que tienen una, una contaminación medible, está realmente aquí, a un PPB o menos. Por eso es que estamos enfocados en esa, en esa área de la gráfica. Gracias. Gracias. Uh, mi pregunta es, a la par de escuchar pifas, he escuchado acerca de microplásticos. Entonces, sé la diferencia de que las pifas contienen cloro, flor, pero mi pregunta es, ¿cuál es más peligrosa? O sea, porque he escuchado más de microplásticos acerca de las pifas, sin embargo, ahorita escuché que también tienen repercusiones en el cuerpo humano las pifas como los microplásticos? Pues mira, yo creo que determinar cuál es más perjudicial es, está difícil, pero sí te puedo decir desde el punto de vista técnico, ¿verdad? PIFAS son moléculas, son moléculas bien definidas 
por lo tanto se comportan como moléculas, mientras que los microplásticos, a fin de cuentas, pues son partículas que no necesariamente tienen las mismas propiedades de una molécula. Por ejemplo, la, eh, la, la, la solución, ¿no? Microplásticos son suspensiones, no son soluciones. Entonces, eso que, ¿cuáles son las, 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 las diferencias? Eh, transporte celular. Pensar en transporte celular de una molécula es mucho más fácil que el transporte eh, a través de la membrana celular de una, de una partícula que ya está pues, de, de perdida a escala nanométrica. ¿no? Mientras que estas pues, están a escala eh, de unos cuantos angstroms. Okay. Entonces, esa, esa, es la, esa es una de las, de, las, de las diferencias. Pero sí, tienes toda la razón. El área de, de los microplásticos, que realmente se les dice microplásticos, pero los, 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 este, eh, los más peligrosos son los nanoplásticos. Nano. Sí, o sea, con, con son partículas como si fueran nanopartículas. Porque entonces se empiezan a comportar casi como moléculas. Okay. Thank you. Bien, pues agradecemos la asistencia de todos ustedes. Los invitamos a continuar en las sesiones de cada una de las divisiones. Y agradecemos al doctor Raúl Hernández por esta presentación tan ilustrativa de su trabajo. Muchísimas gracias y un aplauso para él, por favor.